That then spawned this idea in my head. I want to be a meteorologist. I want to know why this happened. I want to know how. I want to know, can this happen again? And I want to know how I can help people if it does happen again. And I just remember watching the coverage and thinking, that's what I want to do. I'm Brandon Dawson, and this is The Distiller, a podcast about how we find meaningful work and how we find meaning in the work we do. My guest for this episode is WLWT broadcast meteorologist Allison Rogers. Allison has been with WLWT, the Cincinnati NBC affiliate, for just over a year. She's currently the weekend primetime meteorologist and does roving duty during the week. I'm going to be honest, when I think of TV weather... I generally think of Harris Telemacher, the wacky weekend weatherman character Steve Martin plays in the movie L.A. Story. It's more entertainment than content. But as you'll hear, Allison is on the opposite end of whatever spectrum that is. Part scientist, part journalist, part TV celebrity. And it's a job that can go from being the person who tells you whether to wear a sweater that day to someone you rely on for your own personal safety in a matter of minutes, such as when a tornado warning sounds. As chance would have it, Allison and I met at the end of just such a week on a Friday afternoon when the tornado warnings had been in effect in and around Cincinnati for two days, where storms had already done some damage and there was the possibility of more to come. We met at Left Bank Coffee in Covington, Kentucky, where Russ and Maggie, the owners of Left Bank, were kind enough to let us in after they'd closed up for the day, and they kept our cups full and hot as we talked. And with that, let's get into it. Here is my conversation with meteorologist Allison Rogers on The Distiller. Well, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Coffee, coffee cheers. Glad to have you here, and especially on a day when I know you have been crazy busy the last couple of days. Yeah, yeah. I've got to say it's weird to be on this side of the mic, <laughs> but it's that. fun. Yeah. Good, good, good. And we should explain to people, because this probably won't air for a week and a half, two weeks, um, that this is a day in which all of yesterday in Cincinnati was filled with tornado warnings yes. and alerts and some crazy weather. Yes. That came through. I was stuck in the middle of the Marshalls store in Norwood. Oh, no. When that when cell came through. When the one came through, Yeah. That was that was nuts. I drove through drove through about two feet of standing water at the corner of Montgomery and Norwood Avenue, which uh, I know I'm not supposed to do. You're you're probably supposed to tell me not. I'm cringing right now. Yeah, <laughs> cringing. And then today, there there even though the weather has been a little more relaxed today, there still have been warnings and alerts and things coming across. So yeah, so uh, we had the tornado warnings yesterday afternoon and evening, um, and the watches and everything. So yesterday was. It was a long day, but then by the end of the day, I felt like it went by so quickly. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, I was, it was a good, it was, I'm glad everyone was safe. Yeah. And, you know, of course, I hate that we've had the damage that we had, but now today was a little bit more relaxed. It's cold, but, you know. Yeah. Things are things are calming down. Things are calming down for the weekend. A little bit. I I remember. So I was in broadcasting for the first like okay. fifteen years of my career. I was in radio, and uh, I was a music DJ. And it was standard morning show. You know, you go and you play the music. Everything's light and fluffy. Yeah. And then and then there were a couple of events throughout my career where major national news stories happened, and. It changes the focus of everything you do. Entertainment and information becomes crisis management and becomes real important. And you have to sound calm. Right. right? Even though you in the middle of it are asking the same questions that everybody else is asking. I got to imagine that yesterday is maybe one of those types of days where, and you don't get to say, well, I'm off at, I'm off at two today or I'm off at Correct. three. You're not off until... Until the story's been told and and you can put people's fears to you rest. You get the all clear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, when it comes to weather, we were expecting yesterday, we knew the risk going into the day. We knew that we could potentially have a couple of tornado warnings and other sorts of warnings. So um, I suppose that's different when it comes to breaking news, right? You never mm -hmm. know when breaking news right, is going to happen. Right, you sort of happen. know that something's going to come. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you're prepared in that regard. And, of course, with schooling and everything. Um, but, yeah, I don't think anything really compares to that feeling throughout the event that you have. And same, I'm sure, with breaking news as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you kind of have adrenaline and everything. So... Yeah, it's very interesting, and it it's always so 
interesting to me as well is because, you know, you, you do come across um, – calm and you know you just want to talk everyone hopefully through everything so. yeah exactly yeah. hopefully so um and it's so it's just it's very um it's a crazy experience it really is yeah. and it's one that you know of course I never want to see anybody get hurt and I mm. never want to see any town get destroyed or anything like that um but one of those things that you prepare for in school, your teachers say, hey, this kind of thing could happen to you wherever you are in your market. And yeah. um, you never really know in school where you're going to end up because <laughs> you kind of go where the job is yeah, and yeah. everything and you move around quite a bit. Um, but I think, you know, once that sort of event is at your doorstep, you kind of have to compartmentalize and you say like, okay, here's priority one, two, three. And you kind of just take everything as it comes throughout the day. Yeah, but stay Stay professional, stay focused. Of course, yes, stay of course. Calm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. absolutely. Well, let's backtrack a, a, a little bit because I want to talk about several of the things that you just mentioned, yeah. the nature of the business and getting into this field and knowing that travel is going to be involved and knowing there are certain things you're going to have to follow over mm -hmm. the course of your career. But let's talk, first of all, about why why a person gets into meteorology and more specifically, why did you, when was the first time you knew that meteorology was a thing? That okay. You recall? So I've known for a long time. Okay. I, and you'll find this with a lot of meteorologists, actually, if you read their bios on station websites, or if you just kind of know any sort of meteorologist, a lot of them have a similar story where it's one specific event sparked mm. their interest as a young kid. And then they decide to study it and stick with it. Um, and for me, that was definitely the case. I would say it started when I was, really young simply because my dad um, was an oceanographer when I was growing up. And so he always had a big interest in the weather. And I grew up not in Ohio, not in Kentucky. I grew up in Mississippi along okay. the Gulf Coast. Okay. So I grew up around thunderstorms constantly, afternoon yeah. storms during the summers and springs. And so we would sit and watch storms roll in. We would go out to the beach, watch the storms roll in. Um, so that always interests me. And then when I was 12, that was 2005. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the year, a very active hurricane season that year. Yeah. That was the year that Hurricane Katrina hit the Mississippi coast, hit the Louisiana coast, and um, almost completely devastated my hometown. Wow. Fortunately, my house was okay. We were far enough north that we didn't have to worry about the storm surge. Mm -hmm. We were very fortunate that, um, you know, hurricanes often spin up little tornadoes. Yep. We were very fortunate that our house was not hit by one of those and that none of the rivers near our home got close enough to flood our right, house. Right, right. Um, so, so yeah, I was 12 years old. I think that's a very uh, crucial age because I think you are really starting to get interested in things yeah. that are happening and things really start to influence you at that age. You're old enough to know what's going on. You're not six or seven to where you you don't have context for it, but you're also young enough to be really impressionable, yeah. to have those be indelible exactly. memories. Yeah, exactly. So um, I remember like almost every single day leading up to Katrina and events that followed immediately after. And the Sunday before it hit on a Monday, the Sunday before, so we never evacuated for hurricanes when I was growing up. Mm. Um, but the Sunday before is when it was upgraded to a category five, which for anyone who's not familiar with weather, that's the strongest mm -hmm. hurricane, um, category. Yep. So it was upgraded to a cat five as it was in the Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico. And my dad and I had gone out to run our typical hurricane errands. So we would go get ice for the cooler cause we were going to lose power. And so we would put some, you know, different food in the cooler and things like that. Go gas up the cars get extra batteries, all of the typical things. So we're out running errands. And I remember my dad and I took a little longer because we wanted to drive around the coast one more time. And he was kind of pointing at things saying, you know, that building may not be there after Monday or whatever. And, you know, I'm kind of thinking like, okay. Um, it's not real until... Right. And happens. hurricanes happened all the time. Yeah. Like I always say, growing up, we had hurricane days. We did not have snow days. I did not know that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a kid from Idaho. We had the snow days. Okay. Like the idea of having a regular hurricane preparation circuit with your dad mm -hmm. is crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's the same with snowstorms. I mean, yeah. when a snowstorm's coming, you know what to do. Yeah. Right? So hurricane was coming. We knew what to do. Um, and 
So we get back to the house and my mom is in the driveway, which was kind of odd, Hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because like, I think anytime you see a parent in the driveway, you're like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. So we get out of the car and my mom's on the phone and she was like, it's been upgraded to a Cat 5. We're leaving. Okay. And we were like, what? Yeah, Um, this isn't the normal drill. Right. Uh, Because, you know, A, we didn't evacuate for hurricanes. B, it is less than 24 hours away from making landfall. Mm. Trying to leave at that point in time is, you know, you're looking at sitting in hours and hours of traffic. How far are you going to get? Right. And also, how many hotels are still available at this point in time? We have a dog, you know, all these different things. We have other family that we need to help out, neighbors. So we... My mom said, pack a bag. We're leaving. So I packed a bag. I didn't know how long to pack a bag for because this was very abnormal. Yeah. And um, again, you're 12. So I think you're picking up things that, you know, I see like, okay, my parents are more concerned about this than usual. This is getting kind of weird. Um, And so we packed the bag. We sat in hours and hours of traffic and we ended up evacuating to Panama City Beach, okay. which is about a four to four and a half hour drive usually. And it took us, I think, eight to nine hours to get there. Wow. So it took us all day. So you're not there. driving north, you're driving east. Correct. So Just we to get were, out of the direct path of the storm. Okay. Right, right. right. And so we did that with a few other families, um, my aunt and uncle and cousin, one of the families. So you know, at the same time that this is happening, I'm also thinking like, oh, a quick little trip to Panama City. Okay, fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do it, and then we start seeing all the coverage, and it just looks horrible. Yeah. You know, it's like we're seeing devastation out of Louisiana. We're seeing devastation out of Mississippi, where we lived. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think that was that was just a time where I was watching all of this coverage and watching it because we are relying 100% on what these people are saying and clinging to every word they are saying. And I remember my mom would say like, oh, I'm going to go take a walk. If they start talking about Mississippi, pay attention. Right. Um, And so, you know, yeah, you're clinging on to every single word that the news is saying. Yeah. And so then we get back and, find out that our house is okay, thankfully. And then though we had, um, you know, all this recovery and this rebuilding for our community that needed to be done and clean up and it looked horrible. It smelled horrible. It looked like a bomb went off Mm -hmm. in our downtown. And also I had no idea if my friends were still alive. I had no idea because this was pre-social media mm-hmm. for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, this was also, I didn't have a cell phone. So yeah. this yeah. is very different. But again, it's a vulnerable age. I right. mean, 12 is uh, is where you're starting to come to terms with the fact that there's a lot of stuff out there yeah. that not everybody's in control of. Your parents don't own everything. They're yeah. not capable of keeping you safe from everything. Right. And to have such a huge and terrifying event come through at that age for all those reasons, I can imagine that it is incredibly yeah. uh, impactful. Yeah. So I remember just we would drive around after um, and, you know, going to neighborhoods where my friend used to live in that neighborhood and mm-hmm. it's completely gone. Wow. I hope they evacuated. Yeah, yeah. You know, things you like that. Know. And so then I remember going back to school. Actually, I think we went, so Hurricane Katrina hit on the 28th of August. And I don't think we went back to school until maybe either the very end of September or like the 1st of October. Oh, wow. Over a month. Yeah. And during that time as well, we had like no power. We went, I can't remember exactly how long, but it was very long time to be in South Mississippi without power in the dead of summer, heat, humidity, everything. Um, So, yeah, I just remember feeling like living in, like I was living in a third world country Mm because we were, you know, I was taking a bath in the dark and Mm -hmm. just different things. And um, so, yeah, I got back to school and I just remember the feeling of being so happy to be back because it was like, okay, there's so and so, there's so and so. Did your house make it? Are you guys okay? Where are you living? And yeah, it was, it was crazy. So that then 
spawned this idea in my head. I want to be a meteorologist. I want to know why this happened. Mm. I want to know how. I want to know, can this happen again? And I want to know how I can help people if it does happen again. And I just remember watching the coverage and being so inspired by what I was seeing on TV, thinking that's what I want to do. Wow. Yeah. So um, I officially knew at the age of 12. That's crazy. Yeah. And it stuck with you. And it stuck with me. I remember doing um, in seventh grade that same year, Mm -hmm doing a school project of what do you want to be when you grow up? And I chose to be a broadcast meteorologist. And I remember all the other kids, you know, they were being fun things like, um, I don't know, you know, teacher and all these great things that were awesome. And I was just the one that was like, I want to be a broadcast meteorologist. How do you spell meteorology? <laughs> I love that. I mean, I, this is you. I think your episode will be episode 33 or, or 34 uh, in those conversations, in conversations throughout my life, there's a very small number of conversations where you can find somebody that at 12 knew what they were going to do and then actually did it. And then did it, yeah. Didn't deviate from that. There were times where I thought like, oh, can I actually do this? Like when I got the course list <laughs> for college and thinking, right. this is a lot of math and science. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I thankfully I had supportive parents who took me up to Mississippi State. And also, thankfully, I went to a school, I grew up in a state that had a college with a great program for broadcast meteorology. Okay. So I was so fortunate that I didn't have to worry about out-of-state tuition. Right. And it lined up. Home. Yeah, and stayed, you know, semi-close to home. That's where everyone in my family, like cousins and my one sister, she went to Mississippi State. So I was familiar with the area. Okay. And um, went to visit when I was a senior in high school, I think. Yeah, I was a senior in high school. And I went to the broadcast meteorology building and talked to some of the professors. And they gave me a list of courses that I would be taking if I decided to go there. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing all the math and science and thinking, okay, um, I guess I'll prepare now and start taking some of these classes now. And so I took a couple of extra math classes in high school to kind of get myself prepared for what college would bring. Yeah. Um, And then went to Mississippi State and loved it, loved the program and all the professors. I can't speak highly enough about the program Mm -hmm. and the professors. And I got to Storm Chase and the Great Plains. And Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's not... The real stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah, You know what I mean? Like, that's... That, to take a class for storm chasing, most yeah, people I'm don't jealous. do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally jealous. Right. Though. Yeah. So I was super fortunate. And um, yeah. And again, don't get me wrong. There were times where I thought, this is really tough. I don't know if I can do this. And then actually stepping in front of the green screen for the first time and mm-hmm. realizing, okay, this is very tough to, yeah. which I'm sure you can relate to with doing radio. You know, once you start doing it, you kind of think like, oh, wow, okay, my profession is something that everyone's going to hear right. and be able to criticize. Yes. Um, but it, you know. all, in, all in real time. Yeah. And it's such an interesting, as I was thinking about this, it's such an interesting combination of things that you do. And I, I, I feel like we should sort of like, I don't know if this is a perception issue. There is the, there is the perception of Whatever, whatever the person who would be giving the weather on the news that's not a meteorologist is. I don't know, weather right. person. Right, weather caster, yeah. Yeah, and then there's meteorologist. Yeah. Which is a science, which is a de- degree cro- program. I want to clarify from the outset, you are a certified meteorologist. Yeah, I have a degree. You are a scientist. Yeah, yeah. And so forgive me for even needing to clarify no, that. No, I mean. But those, these are different That's fair. Things. Yeah. A lot of people, I think, are still surprised when they um, talk to me or any of our other meteorologists or any meteorologist, that we do make our own forecast. We don't have anybody doing it for us. I mean, right, you're not you know, ripping off the AP wire and correct. just reading somebody else's work. Right, right, right. That's yeah. us, and you know, we're coming up with our own forecast and looking at everything, constantly looking at everything. Um, I remember my professors in college saying, you're going to always look at computer models. No matter what, you're always going to know what's going on. And I was thinking, like, Really? But yeah, no, really. Like, <laughs> That's really it. I feel like sometimes I take it for granted. I always know how to dress. I always know what to expect at least. And, you know, and then I meet people or meet friends and they say like, I had no idea it was going to rain today. And I'm just like, really? If only there was someone to tell you. <laughs> yeah. If, if only somebody was trying that to figure you. that out. Yeah. Yeah. But so it's, it is such an interesting cross section of journalism, mm-hmm. of just broadcasting and everything that goes along with with media and a public 
persona, yeah. which you have to cultivate in today's media world in order to be successful, and then science. Yeah. And I guess, you know, whatever, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I mean, there are, there are famous scientists mm-hmm. increasingly, which is a great cultural phenomenon. But for you to decide to go into this, it's such separate disciplines. It is. I, w- I was going to ask you, just learning to do the, the green screen work, just the, <laughs> like where to put your hands, how yeah. to control... How did, how did, that you've got this green screen behind you right, that you're pointing see. at things on that you can't see. Yeah. All of that is an entirely separate yeah. personal development process from just actually learning the science of Meteorology. following and predicting the weather. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, that's one thing that I loved about my program in college was they spent um, two full years with us on the green screen. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a long time for, yeah. you know, a class, you meet, your lab is working on the green screen and you start to get to a point where you are doing it independently as well. You know, we had 24 hour access to our green lab and mm-hmm. um, so we could step in front of the green screen as much as we wanted, internships as well. So, yeah, it was very awkward little duckling at first. <laughs> it, was, it was uncomfortable to watch. I remember there was a lot of like kind of touching my hair and putting it behind my ear and <laughs> saying like, yeah, maybe you want to grab a sweater. I don't know. It might be chilly to you. I don't know. Right. And it, yeah. Did you have to, in radio, you do air check sessions? Yeah. So I actually did radio in college to get my voice ready okay. to go um, for TV. And also I loved music and still do. Mm-hmm. So I, I did radio at our little college radio station and I would do the forecast for them. Awesome. Um, and I would kind of say, you know, just whatever Mississippi State was going to be getting for the next two days for the weather. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Um, and then uh, did the green screen class and did internships and then got my first job in a very small market, mm-hmm. a very small town in eastern Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, you have to be willing to move wherever right. The job is. And you knew that. That was ultimately why I got out of radio. Okay. Um, was because I knew there were other factors, you know, media consolidation and the dwindling number of jobs, period. But I also knew that in order to follow this path, so I got, I'm the opposite of you. Okay. I stumbled into that when I was 16. Nice. You know, a friend, I knew a friend who worked at a radio station. I thought it'd be an interesting summer job. And then 15 years later, it was said, still interesting. <laughs> it, was, it was still interesting, but I also knew, and it was very creative, but I knew that in order to, to, I had fallen from job to job, and I knew that in order at that point to continue, because I was starting to get management jobs, I was, a, you know, the program director of a radio station, and I knew that in the market that I was in, I would pretty much bounced around to all the groups, and now to get the next big job. I would have to travel somewhere. Right. The more people I talked to, I knew that the life cycle was generally two to three years. Yeah. And if you were if you were constantly moving up, you were moving markets every two to three years. Sometimes you'd have a longer stint. And generally, if you weren't moving, it meant that you weren't continuing to progress. Right. So, yeah, in college, they kind of warn you um, right off the bat when you start taking your meteorology classes. They say, okay, you know, you're going to have to move somewhere. Mm-hmm going to be a small town at first and then you'll get to kind of go to a bigger area and then a bigger area and then maybe you'll find somewhere you want to stay forever or, you know whatever and um so I like that though yeah yeah I like to You're be able to kind of yeah I yep. like learning different areas I like to travel and I like to kind of see how different people live and I moved my first job was in a teeny tiny town, Hazard, Kentucky. Okay. Not far from here. No, no, no. And that's how I knew about Cincinnati because I, you know, moved to Hazard. I had never been to Kentucky before in my life until my interview for that job. Right. And I went and interviewed and I thought, you know, I think this could really be a great place for me to start my career. It seemed like there was going to be a lot of opportunity Mm -hmm. and there was, and I loved it. And I stayed a little bit longer than people typically stay at their first job. Um, Just because I was still learning and, you know, I wanted to keep learning and I wanted to really make my time there worth it. And um, I knew it wasn't going to be forever for me. And I enjoyed my time there a great deal, learned a lot, got a lot of mistakes kind of out of the way at first Uh and um, things, you know, that I didn't think would be something that I would come across in, you know, my career, just different things come up, you know what I mean? Yeah. And 
So um, it was a great experience there. And time came and I, you know, it was kind of getting to that point where I was thinking, okay, time to move on. Where do I want to try to get to next? And it's a very competitive industry. Yeah, yeah. Very competitive. And I was very fortunate that um, the opening here mm -hmm. came up and I, this was a city I really wanted to try to get to. Um, I didn't know if I was going to be able to, cause it's a big city. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think in terms of radio DJs think in terms of market numbers? Yeah. Market numbers. It's okay. A big so city. what, what market number is hazard? Do you know? Um, so it's interesting because it's lumped into the Lexington market. Okay. It's not its own independent. So it's technically 63. Okay. But it's much smaller than that. It's considerably outside of, yeah. I mean, if it was its own market, it would be in the two or three hundreds probably. It would, yeah. So markets go from, I think, 210 to one. And of course, New York City is number one. And yep. 210 is a small, I don't even know what 210 would be. Um, but yeah, it would be somewhere probably. What's, what's Cincinnati? Cincinnati, I, oh gosh, you're putting me on the spot. It's in the 30s. <laughs> okay. That All much right. I know. It's in the 30s. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I always think like, I know it's bigger than Louisville. But I know it's smaller than Baltimore. <laughs> and that's based on, for people that are listening, that's based on population size yeah. and all of the, you know. TVs listener, per household. I, th I think, so I'm from Boise, Idaho. Okay. I think I think Boise was like 171 or 121 or something yeah. like that during most of the time that I was there. And I think the area I grew up, maybe in the 160s, I'm not even sure. Like, because okay. we were close to New Orleans and that's in the right. 40s or maybe 50s. But that's how you know is you want to go, you know, you want to jump up. You want to be in a top 100 market. Right. You want to be in a top 20 market. Yeah, you have all these goals. Like, I want right. to be in a top 10 by the time I'm 30 or I want to be in a 20 by the time I'm 30 or whatever. Right. Yeah. So what are we share? Do you have... Do I have goals? Do you have goals? Um. So my goals are... They were much different in college. You know, mm -hmm. of course, in college, I think you were, you're thinking, oh, I want to be the next so-and-so or so-and-so. Right. Um, and now that I'm older, my goal is just to continue to learn mm -hmm. and to feel like I'm still growing as a professional. And as long as I'm doing that, I'm happy. Right on. And I'm still learning so much. And I'm very fortunate that I am because... Mm -hmm there's a lot to learn about meteorology. It's ever changing. Yeah. And even broadcasting itself, there's still so much to learn and there's a lot for me to learn. And yep. um, yeah, so my goal is to just keep learning and keep growing as a professional and a broadcaster yeah. and meteorologist. Um, so do you have to, you have to continue to recertify, right? There's um, ongoing continuing education. So I'm, let's see. So I have a degree in, um, Operational meteorology is what Mississippi State kind of refers to it as. Okay. Every university is a little bit different. Mississippi State has a great program for broadcast meteorology, a great program for professional, and professional meteorology would be more on the research side. Okay. So if I were to continue to go into school, grad school, mm -hmm. um, and then broadcasting, of course, is for television. Mm -hmm. I did sort of a hybrid option where you take all the communications classes, you take all the maths and sciences, and you do both. That way, in case you decide to go one way, you can. Okay. Other way, you can also do that. Because I, once I got to college, I didn't really know if I wanted to go into research mm -hmm. and continue to study in school. I didn't know if I wanted to try TV out. Uh, and then a very wise professor said, try television, see how that works out, because that's very tough to get into. Right. And if you do well, keep doing that. If not, school's always there. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. um, so yeah, you could always continue your education, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But for the, wh who is it? The American Meteorological, Meteorological Society. Society. Yeah. The AMS and then yeah. you've got the CBM, all these different seals and things like that. So yeah, you take tests, you submit tapes to a panel of people and they review and see if you have gotten your stamp or your seal or mm -hmm. anything like that. So yeah, those are still things that, um, a lot of meteorologists, including myself, are still working toward as yeah. well. So, yeah. So the the travel is one of the sort of occupational hazards, the fact that you're going to move around a yeah. lot. Uh, another is your hours. <laughs> do you want to know what time I woke up today? Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> 1 a.m. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, 1 a.m. Yeah. I So I um, filled in for our morning meteorologist okay. today. So that's not typical for me to wake up that early. Sometimes it is. Yeah. I'd say it happens a few times a month, usually. But you just knew that there was going to be that much work to be done that you would need to get up. 
Yeah, so we go on air at five, at four thirty. All right. So and of course we got to do our own forecasting, got to yep. do our own hair and makeup. Yep. And um, different things, you know, radio records, things like that. And so yeah, we're on air at four thirty, and then it's pretty much like go 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 until seven a.m. rolls around, and then I get a second to sit. And then it's go, go, go again because we're on throughout. For the late morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the noon and everything. So morning show hours, very early. Yep. Evening hours, very late. Yeah. So, yeah. My schedule typically changes week to week, just depending. Um, but that's something I also knew going into it yep. was going to be um, just something that I would have to do. And I don't mind it because some days I'm done with work at one o'clock yeah. in the afternoon, yeah. which is awesome. And then some days I don't have to go in until one or two o'clock in the afternoon, which is also really cool. Yep. So. Yeah, a lot of that flexibility and a lot of freedom. Yeah, yeah. I can make doctor's appointments during the week and there you go. haircuts and stuff during the week. It's awesome. Go to the store when it's uh -huh. not that crowded. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, it's interesting talking to people who have like an eight to five or a nine to five. Right. I'm always just so fascinated. Like, Oh, you can do these different things that most events are kind of catered to your hours. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I used to have this uh, this weird sort of mental picture. So one of the other things that I did was I, I tour managed bands for a little while and mm. I would tour around. And it's sort of that, like, I've never really figured out, I need to figure out a better way to talk about this. But there is an, there's an entire sort of infrastructure of media and entertainment that feeds all of the things that happen during the regular work hours. Yeah. And if you were, if all of those people had a light and you could like view it from space, you'd see this weird sort of mm -hmm. circulatory system of all the stuff that feeds everybody else's media consumption and entertainment yeah. consumption. And it's this whole world overlay that goes over yeah. everything else and happens outside of the normal time cycle of all that. And you know what's interesting too is I find that there are so many other professions that actually have weird hours that you mm -hmm. would never think about. Um, my mom was a nurse before she retired and she had crazy hours as well, working yep. weekends, working nights. And uh, so we can kind of relate and we'll share stories about that. Yeah. So that's really cool. Uh, and then, I don't know, there are just so many other professions where I think, wow, you get it. Everybody thinks the nine to five is the regular. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's not. I think it's opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You might, you might be right. It'd be interesting to see statistics on how many people actually work whatever we yeah. consider normal hours. Yeah. So describe whether it's today at 1 a.m. or what would be considered a normal day. Okay. What do you actually do? And I mean, what are the things that just are part of your rhythm Yeah. that you wouldn't think? What does creating your forecasts involve? How long does it take you to do it? Mm -hmm. Walk through some of that. We know what it's like when you're on the air. Yeah. But that's the smallest percentage of, it your, is. of your day. That's three minutes of my day. Yeah. What is everything else that people have no idea goes into what you do? Yeah. So a lot of it is preparation for the show. So um, doing the own, my own forecast. So that typically will take anywhere from 20 minutes to maybe even as long as an hour, depending on how complex it is. Mm -hmm. So what I do with that is I'm looking at different computer models. I'm looking at different current data observations from satellite, uh, temperature data, things like that. And after I've looked at everything, I still do the old school, write it all down on a piece of paper. And then once I have those numbers... I start inputting that information into our computers. Okay. So we are responsible for updating our website, mm -hmm. the forecast discussion on that. We're responsible for making sure the app has all the correct mm -hmm. forecast information. Um, and then actually putting those numbers onto the graphics mm -hmm. that people see at home. Yep. So we make those as well. Um, bigger markets sometimes have weather producers that will help out, but we're still at that point where we do all of our own yep. stuff make our own graphics. Um, and so we're putting, you know, if tonight's low is 31 degrees, I'm putting that in the graphic to make You're sure it actually, says. You're actually building what we're seeing on the right, screen. 31 degrees, you know, breezy, whatever. Yep. Um, and so that typically takes, let's see, I walk in, forecast right away, and I also will brief the newsroom so that they know what's going on as well. So that way um, there's no question yeah. of, what's going on with the weather mm -hmm. and you know they can put it where they need to in the news cycle if yeah. it's a big deal yeah if it's a big deal we're gonna go we're gonna come up quicker yep. um if there's bigger news stories happening obviously those happen first uh and then 
also that helps them figure out how much time we need. And sometimes I'll say, I, this is, I've got too much to talk about. I need more than two yep. minutes and 30 seconds. Cause that goes by super quick. Yep. Uh, I need three or I need three. And are you running that by the producer and the producer mm-hmm. says yes or no? And yeah. Nope. Sorry. You don't get it. Today. Yeah. Sorry. We're super busy. Can't yeah. do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's all with the producer. And, you know, they trust us as experts to yep. say, this is a day that warrants us having more or less time. Okay. Um, and so we'll do that. And then by the time I'm done forecasting, getting all my graphics built, updating all the websites and talking to the producers, Usually it's 30 minutes until show. Okay. So that takes anywhere from two to three hours. All right. Yeah. Well, you mentioned computer models. What uh-huh. are you looking at? Are you looking at exactly what we see when you show us computer models, which is the maps sort of. and the colored graphs and yeah. the radar? Okay. Sort of. So radar is all current uh, information. Okay. And so I will look at radar quite a bit. In fact, like I never... Like, I always have access to a radar somehow. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But then we're looking at different models as well. So that's future. Okay. So that's kind of showing us, okay, so here's what this one in particular is saying for the arrival time of the rain or the snow. And here's how much snow this one's calling for and vice versa. And that's where your degree really comes in handy and your experience really comes in hand because you can kind of, you're that human element Mm -hmm. to all of this computer information yep. and model information. Um, and so then, you know, we kind of use our expertise to decide, do we build our own snow map where we're going to put X amount of inches or should we rely on this model because we think it's doing a good job or, um, you know, just different things like that. Okay. So, that's what we mean as far as models. Okay. And then you're now you're 20, 30 minutes mm-hmm. from air. So then I'm probably making sure my hair and makeup look okay because that's all us doing mm-hmm. that. And so either I either have to put it on really quick or I have to just touch it up. Double check. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I'll do it before work. Sometimes, depending on the shift, do it right before the show. Um so making sure that's all in order and then making sure is that, uh, like in I, order. Is that part of your education? No, no, I had to go. I did not know how to do hair or makeup <laughs> growing up. I didn't touch like my hair. I rarely ever brushed it when I was in high school and even in college and never really did makeup at all ever. And so. And it's not, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing. Right. Like I was in broadcasting. It yeah. was, there's a reason people say you have a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> like we never had to do all of that stuff. Yeah. Is it, it's not normal. No, it's not normal makeup. Makeup. No. It's like stage makeup, yeah, essentially. Yeah, pretty much. It's, okay. Now they have, you know, this HD makeup that's supposed to be, Oh my God. Um, I guess, work well with the lights. Right. That shows how much I know. Okay. I, I, a makeup <laughs> consultant has sat with me before and told me what to do and what not to do. So that's what I go by. I yeah. know how to do exactly what you see right now, and I don't know how to do anything <laughs> else. <laughs> That's it. Um, I remember in college, I went, one of my mentors during an internship said, okay, you need to figure out how to do your hair and makeup. So I had to go to the mall, sit at a counter. Mm -hmm. They showed me how to do everything. And then different stations will have you sit with a consultant and they'll kind of help you out as well. Yeah. So. And don't wear green. And don't wear green. I can't wear green. So St. Patty's Day is... (laughs) Because you just disappear. I just disappear, and it's it's yeah. Yeah, it seems like every every year there's some Facebook feed of somebody who forgot who that, or forgot. some small market yeah, and anchor who step in front who didn't do that. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes blue and white, it's just patterns too. Sometimes will key out as well because right. yeah. So behind us is just a green wall, and we can't wear green otherwise we would disappear with the maps. Yep. And um, so yeah, I can't wear green. Certain okay. patterns don't work, things like that. Yeah. So when you are on, so you prepare everything, you've done your hair and makeup, the broadcast is beginning, mm-hmm. producers getting everything ready. Yep. Maybe you're up front. Yep. Maybe you're further back. You are, it's funny because I've I've done uh, enough, I've been on enough newscasts in various capacities while not like hosting anything to see, you know, like the the anchors wearing flip flops or the, right. like the things, you know, that like how it's made, yeah. um, which are the, 
the fun things right. to see behind it that, that don't come through. I wore tennis shoes today. <laughs> there you go. I woke up at 1 a.m. I wore tennis shoes. <laughs> of course you did. Yeah. And it's a long, it's, there, you have a lot of hits in the morning, like every five minutes or so. So there's a lot of walking back and forth. So the more comfortable the shoe, the better. Yep. And I'm clumsy, so... The smaller the heel, the better for me because <laughs> falling on TV is. Have you done that? Oh, uh, yeah, I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that. Yeah, I fell. I was walking and like not here's in my first market. Again, mistakes that you want to get out of the way. Uh-huh. In when Hazard, Kentucky. your audience is a little smaller. Sure. Of course, you know, it's still embarrassing and you don't want those things to happen regardless of where you are. Yeah. But oh, yeah. it did. Um, and, uh, yeah, I tripped on a wire and fell, and you could hear it. You couldn't see it, but you could 100% <laughs> hear it. You knew exactly what was going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I fell. I one time got the hiccups on TV. It, yeah, it's live TV. Things happen. Yeah, and you just know you just power through. You just power, yeah, power through. <laughs> <laughs> just maintain your composure. Yeah, at this point, you know, yeah. And there's got to be, I'm sorry, I keep referring back to broadcasting. Mm-hmm. There, in broadcasting, if you have a co-host, that's your your primary relationship. And uh-huh. if you get along with that person, yeah. it's great. And if you don't, then it's either obvious and awkward for everybody. Or in the case of my last radio gig, it's kind of why everybody tunes in. Is oh, no way. <laughs> how, tense, how tense it's going to be. Yeah. Which is why it was was my last job. But that's like a, you guys are there. Together. Basically the same cast of characters. I mean, like some days you're moving yeah. around, but basically you're with the same group mm-hmm. all the time. That's got to be a pretty strong relationship. Yeah, and you end up becoming, you know, almost like family. Um, right. I was very close to the people in my first market, and here, the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I anchor with Curtis and Molly on the weekends. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my prime time spot is weekend evenings. And, yep. you know, we always we're very close and we always kind of know what's going on with each other and we'll hang out outside of work. Um, and we all get it because I think there's a special bond between people who've been in broadcasting because you know the deal, you move yeah. around a lot and you know that you're probably not living close to your family and you work holidays and mm-hmm. you know you work these crazy hours and you end up do forming these really close relationships. Yep. And I'm very fortunate that I really genuinely like yeah. everyone I work with. And you, there is no sense of having to fake it. You know what I mean? It's all just genuine. It's, it's good. Real. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the other aspect, which is that on days like today, on those crucial days mm-hmm. where something is going on, mm-hmm. whether it's a news or a political issue or a weather issue, mm-hmm. There's a camaraderie, I think, yeah. that builds around the fact that you're you're the messenger. Uh-huh. And you're doing it together. Yeah. Yeah. And and even when something's not going on, you are in a a, a position where nothing gets critiqued as much as media. Right. Even in the best of circumstances, if there aren't days and days of tornadoes, yeah. you're still under the microscope every day. So uh-huh. that camaraderie of of working with people who feel the same thing and speak the same Language has got to be important. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so interesting having a job where people can critique you like that. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of fun because you form these relationships with people, even though you've never met them before. And it's it's really a unique position, one that I'm really happy to have. And it's really fun. It is. I wasn't on the radio and social media. I was. I was. Yeah, it's totally different. Yeah, I, I was. I, imagine. I was off. Yeah. I don't know broadcasting without social media. Oh God, I can't yeah. imagine it with. I, like, I mean, the phone was always there, and people were very, very happy to share their their opinion. their opinions. Yeah. But it that was there's a there's a, a level of breakdown of um, decorum. Mm-hmm between somebody having to call and speak to your voice on or leave you even a voicemail versus somebody being able to fire off a a, a snarky Facebook comment. Yeah. Um yeah, there is. And it I so you know, I can't imagine it without social media. Yeah. So I just kind of take social media as a way to just connect with people even farther. Mm-hmm. And to talk to people and also a way to get the message out about the weather. If there's something crucial going on I'm going to immediately try to tweet it or try to put it on Facebook yep. or something. That way people can get that information as quickly as possible. Um, and also I think you're 
perhaps maybe reaching a different audience yep. that way as well. Yep. So yeah, I, I love it. I do. I love social media and I like kind of being able to talk to people even if I don't know them because it feels like we're kind of forming, you know, this uh, more of a uh, communication together, you know? Right. And people, yeah. you know, you get the sense of appreciation for that what you're putting out there isn't right. just disappearing out into the air. Right. Yeah. I Exactly. It. I can't tell you how welcoming the city was to me when I got here. Cause that's the other scary thing is, are they, right. they going to like me? Yeah, yeah. And everyone, you know, it's, I've just been so fortunate that people have seemed to um, be very nice and welcoming and very it's, hospitable. When you got the Cincinnati job, mm -hmm. uh, how, describe that process. So you were, uh, I'm just trying to get to the mechanics of this. Do you have yeah. an agent who finds that for you or are no. you looking for that job yourself? Yeah, that was all me. Okay. Um, you can have an agent. But, um, but I, I, yep. I didn't and don't. And, um, uh, so it's a lot of, um, it's interesting talking to people who have been in the business for years and decades versus people who have been in it, you know, as long as I have, which isn't necessarily very long. Um, I guess that post digital era mm -hmm. where for me, it's as simple as YouTube link with my resume reel okay. and emailing that or something. And I say simple, but. Compared yeah, yeah. to what people used to have oh, to do, yeah. sending actual VHS tapes and mailing those off. Well, and just having, getting those edited together. Exactly. Pre-iMovie. Yeah, yeah. pre-iMovie, pre, oh gosh, all those different editing programs. Yeah, you had to, the tape-to-tape -tape editing and everything like that. And, and the boxes. <laughs> I still have one box. I, honestly, I still have it. I haven't been in radio for 16 years. I have a box of air check tapes. Mm -hmm and quarter inch reels mm -hmm. and all of the stuff that was like the last box when I got rid of everything else is the last box that I haven't gotten rid of. Yeah, you hear all the um, people, even just people who have been in it simply another five years longer than me. Yeah. And they all have the same story. It's, yeah, I remember sending out physical tapes and yeah. things like that. And it's so interesting. So yeah, the process is, you know, we have a link and... Uh, kind of a montage of our work and you talk to different people, you get feedback on what's good, what's not good, yep. what you want to change out, things like that. And uh, you apply for jobs that way. It's very interesting. And of course, your paper resume is important as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very different, I think, from other jobs. I, it's so funny because I don't really know how other industries work because right. I'm so used to this is your, the way television This is your is. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I did notice that so I was looking through. It's funny because you were talking about social media. Uh -huh. And obviously I Googled, looked at your LinkedIn yeah. page and things like that. And I noticed that uh, the first thing that came up around your move to Cincinnati was mm -hmm. you did like a Facebook Live. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of introduction. Uh -huh. Here I am. Mm -hmm. I was surprised by that because I thought, oh, this is probably a couple minutes of hi, here's who I am. You're going to see me on your TV in a minute. Yeah. It was like 45 minutes long. 45 minutes of me talking to people and mispronouncing Geta. <laughs> <laughs> well, that yeah. can be forgiven. <laughs> yeah. Because people asked me if I liked it. And I remember thinking. Like it. I don't know what it is. What is this? And I can't remember how I pronounced it, but it wasn't correct. And yeah. quickly people started sending, like putting the phonetics of how to say it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to love that. Part of it, yeah. You have to be. It's certainly not a business for somebody who doesn't, who's more introverted, right? Yeah, and I love Facebook Live for that reason because that gives you the option to talk to people and know automatically what they want to know. And so I started doing those Facebook Lives on a weekly basis, and then that started helping me even more connect with the audience and connect with people watching because. I was getting their questions of, well, what time is, you know, this going to happen or what's going to happen on this day because there's an FCC game or there's a Bengals right. game. And it's, oh, okay, so this is what people actually yeah. want to know, not just me thinking something is really interesting because we had a 30-degree temperature drop in yeah. two hours. That probably doesn't interest most people. Right. But as a scientist and as a meteorologist, yeah, that is interesting to me. Sure. But, you know, it that's just one of the ways social media has – really helped me out in my yep. career and helped me. And yeah, it's really, really interesting to think about. Like How that. do you know? So um, it, 
there are the there are the immediate quantifiers of I'm making connection. Mm-hmm. People are responding. Mm-hmm. The opposite of that is probably a really bad sign if you're putting things out there and people aren't asking you questions uh-huh. on your Facebook Live videos. But that one, certainly, it's just completely full. Yeah. What other, because people don't know what you do. Yeah. What are the other indicators of when you know you're doing a good job? How is TV rated these days? And what are the things that you're paying attention to? Um, you know. Both like hard metrics in terms of things you're looking at, like with your producers and then uh-huh. also just other indicators. Yeah. Um. That's a good question. And honestly, not something, you know, that I spend too much time thinking about. And I don't know, you know, I I really like what I do and I feel really happy when I um, feel like I've done a good job with a forecast or mm-hmm. with a show or something like that. And occasionally we'll get the phone call and people say, hey, thank you for this or that. So that's always really nice. And then, you know, you hear people on the street or, you know, maybe a friend of a friend say like, oh, my mom watched you today and she loved whatever, whatever, you know, things like that. And then my mom still watches every single show that I do. And so she'll send me a text (laughs) message after every show (laughs) and say either like what you wore or great forecast, love the graphics. Now she kind of knows the lingo and she says, great graphic. I love the one with all the... um, I don't know, colors or bars or things like that. So it's always fun yeah. to hear from my mom. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah. Does she watch, she watches it online? Online. Yeah. She'll stream it because mm-hmm. oh, they live so in, you know, out of state. And yeah, yeah, so yeah. they'll watch it. And I remember the first time they visited me, they said it was so fun to see me actually on a physical TV rather than on their phone. Right. You know, so. Right. Yeah. Right. Or on the Twitter feed or, uh-huh. or whatever else. Yeah. So, uh, we started off talking about the the tornadoes uh-huh. and the hurricanes. Have yeah. you had to be in those sort of dangerous situations yet? Um, I have not been in a hurricane. I've not been, other than the storm chase mm-hmm. and um, I suppose, you know, tornado warning yesterday. Yeah. Um, I've not gone out and chased storms I remember the, the night of the big snowstorm a yes. month or two ago. You I was were in the middle on, of that. I, was, I saw you on the Twitter feed and I was like, what are you, I was in the middle of that. <laughs> what are you doing? Go home. <laughs> that, yeah, I was in the middle of that. Um, so, so far, the events I've really kind of gotten a lot of in the field experience with has been the flooding. So last year, of course, last February, we had the flooding of the Ohio River. Yep. Um, I remember that was within two months of me moving here. Hmm. Um, and I was, you know, down in Covington and I was right along the riverfront and reporting from that. And then the snowstorm a couple of, I guess at this point, it's been a month or two Mm -hmm. uh, ago. Yeah, I was in the middle of that as well. And that's probably the most intense storm I've been in the middle of because it was, I'm in the middle of these strong winds that were gusting around 45 miles per hour, also getting hit in the face with snow slash sleet slash ice. Yeah. And it was really cold. Um, and I'm the girl from Mississippi who still doesn't own snow pants. <laughs> so that's changing. <laughs> that's changing for next year. Um, but yeah, so those two, those are probably the two things that stick out in my mind the most for being out in the field and covering, which yep. I, I enjoy doing that sort of coverage as much as you can because I'm still cognizant of the fact that this is a strong storm and this is impacting people on a very serious level. Um, But from, you know, a science standpoint Mm -hmm. and from a meteorology standpoint, those are things that I do like to see in person because that's really putting the forecast for me into perspective of, yeah, I've been saying we're going to have blowing snow with 45 mile per hour winds. Now I'm actually seeing it. I'm actually seeing what that does. Right. When you know? you're in the middle of it. Yeah, you can warn people. Mm-hmm. It was interesting because I've lived here now 15 years. We didn't really have, there was a tornado in Idaho when I was like six that yeah. tore the roof off the Circle K. It was the, the only thing that ever happened in terms of a weather event here just about every season, there's there's, there's at something. least yeah, there's something coming through, mm-hmm. and uh, we're also like right here where we are in Cincinnati. People out west that I talk about Cincinnati, they're like, oh, you're, are you getting that 
lake effect winter. I say, no, we're further south than that. Are yeah. you getting all the, tor- all, the, all the hurricane stuff? No, we're mostly further yeah. north than that. We're not right in Tornado Alley. Right. We sit in a somewhat little protected pocket compared yeah. to what a lot of other regions get. Mm-hmm. But yesterday, um, you know, I had, I had stopped off at the store there in Norwood to grab a pair of glasses. Mm-hmm. Um, the storm comes through. I heard the sirens. Mm-hmm. But I don't generally pay that much attention to the sirens right. because not much has happened in the time that I've lived here. That was actually frightening. We yeah. were all lined up along the glass walls in front of the store, and I couldn't tell. The, the, the wind and the rain were so strong that I couldn't tell if it was the sirens we were hearing or, or if, if it, it was, was the, the wind right. you know, coming through the, the, uh, the things that were holding up the awning for the store. And it's really easy to go from... I'm a person who likes weather. People ask me, like, what kind of weather do you like? I like weather. If something's happening, then I'm happy. That's frightening. Yeah. That was a moment where you sort of say, did I make a bad move? Have I put myself in danger by not taking shelter? Or, you know, should I have listened more to think about where I was going to be at this specific time today? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, that's fair. So as the person who is responsible for helping people make those Mm -hmm. decisions, it's all... You know, it's it's weather, and you're telling people, mm-hmm. and I don't I don't want to minimize it, but it's like no, there's a difference sure. between saying you should take an extra sweater, or you should take a layer today, yeah, to saying for the love of God, get somewhere safe and protect yourself. Don't go out today. That's what I remember in college. My professors said, severe weather is going to make or break you as a professional. Um, when push comes to shove, that's your time to help people, yep. and. I mean, that's absolutely right. Don't get me wrong. I love days when I can tell people it's going to be sunny and 70 and mm-hmm. that they can just get outside and enjoy. Mm-hmm. I do. But also, I have a huge role, and I, as well as the rest of my team, we have a huge role in telling people what to expect and making sure that they are as prepared as possible without being scared, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So prepare, not scare. That was something Randy was saying yesterday, and I just mm. love yep. the way that sounds because it's very true. You know, you want to ha- tell people... Here's what's going to happen, and we're going to get through it. Like, this is going to be the scenario. Put yourself in the best situation possible, and we'll be right there with you the entire way, and we'll protect you as much as we can and prepare you for what's going on yep. and talk you through everything that is going on. Right. So, we, um, this podcast, we talk about work. That's, Obvious, right. but but very often what I like to talk to people about, apart from the mechanics of how they do what they do, and this is has been super interesting because I think for a lot of people, they watch you or someone like you in whatever city they live in every mm-hmm. single day and have absolutely no idea what goes into choosing this career yeah. and then preparing it every day. Do you think about your work in sort of a larger sense like that when when... You know, if if people talk about like somebody's life's work or your relationship to work, what do those words mean to you? And how does everything that we've talked about, about what you actually do every day, form this sense of like how you think about work? Yeah. So work is probably my number one priority with mostly everything. And that's just me. That's my personality. I put as much into it as I possibly can. Um, And you know, still try to maintain a good balance of work and personal and everything like that. But yeah, I mean, I I love it because I can tell people how to, you know, what to expect for the day and what kind of weather is coming their way and also use it as a time to potentially teach someone about something going on. If there's a cool cloud in the sky and I can say, hey, oh, that was a serious cloud or that was a cumulonimbus cloud or a wall cloud or something like that take a moment to kind of give a little science lesson if I can. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not work for me, though. That's the thing. I think that's why I can put so much into it is because it doesn't feel like work. This is something I've wanted to do since I was really young. And it's something that I hope to never take for granted because it's just I'm so fortunate that I love what I do. And... I can't see myself doing anything else. Hmm. Yeah. That's Does that great. make sense? It absolutely makes sense. And there are, 
I love that that position. There aren't a lot of people who get to give that answer. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and love what they're doing, and that it really is the thing that they wanted to do. Yeah, and yeah, it doesn't really feel like work. I think when I started doing these interviews, I thought that there would be more people who could give that answer. Okay. There's a surprisingly small number of people. No, who, that makes me sad. Who no, no, but it should. I would hope that it would make you happy, though, because you have you wanted to do this thing. You have found the thing. You've been able to do the thing. Yeah. And doing the thing has turned out to be something that is fulfilling for you and gives you sort of this this place in the world where you're providing value for people and doing something that's both enjoyable and meaningful. That's a really great combination. Yeah. And if it can, you know, inspire someone else to want to pursue a career that is something that they wake up and don't feel like they're going to work for every day, Mm -hmm. then absolutely. Or if I can inspire, you know, the next 12 year old girl who wants to be a scientist when she grows up, absolutely do it. Yep. You know? Yeah. Or any, anyone, any 12 year old kid, if they want to do something, you know, no dream is too big. Yeah. So on the off chance that there's a 12 year old girl who wants to be a meteorologist, do it. Or somebody's going to pass it to her. Where does she? Where should she go? What <laughs> should? What should she? How does she get in touch with you? How? What should yeah, she look at for resources? Absolutely. So one of the best things about my job, I will say, is that I can connect with um, anyone who wants to try to pursue this career, and I have before, and it's amazing. And I've had people reach out to me saying, "Hey, I'm uh, in high school. I want to go to school to mm-hmm. be a meteorologist. Where should I go?" And of course, I'm going to say Mississippi State. That's where I went. <laughs> but there are so many amazing schools out there. Yep. One of my best friends went to another college. He's an amazing meteorologist. Uh, I have other friends who went to other schools, and they're amazing at what they do as well. So any school that has meteorology, do it. And if, you know, contact someone in the business. It's mm-hmm. a very, very small business. So meeting people, getting to know people in the industry is a great thing to do as soon as you can, because they'll remember you. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I first got to intern with the meteorologist that I grew up watching, I was just in awe. I was like, oh my God, I'm actually meeting her in real life, and this is amazing, and I get to work with her and help her out. Right. And now, you know, she's my mentor, and now she's kind of a colleague because yep. we're both in the industry, and those are relationships that you don't forget. Yeah. And those people are not only generally willing, but eager yeah. to give what they've learned. Yeah. Especially, I think, you know, in TV, it's such a small world and it's such a crazy world that we want, yeah, like, abs- I would help. And if anyone came to me and asked me for advice or help or anything, I would do as much as I could to help them out. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for thank your you. time and for sort of pulling back the curtain and showing us how it's all done and how it's made. And thank you for the work that you do. And uh, I'll try to listen to the sirens a little more. Yeah. (laughs) Find a way to get your forecast. (laughs) Yes. Thank you, Alice. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. This episode of The Distiller was recorded live at Left Bank Coffee House at 701 Greenup Street in Covington, Kentucky. Thanks to Russ, Maggie, and the staff of Left Bank for letting us in after hours and taking such good care of us. Visit our website where you can find photos of our time at Left Bank. It is a perfect, cozy neighborhood coffee house with books on the shelves and comfortable little nooks to talk or study. And most importantly, great coffee. Stop by and say hi to Russ, get something to drink, and tell him you heard it on The Distiller when you do. Thanks again so much to Allison Rogers for making time in what turned out to be an incredibly hectic week to share her story with us. Obviously, you can see Allison on TV in Cincinnati just about every day of the week on Cincinnati's WLWT Channel 5 and at WLWT.com, wherever you live. And you can see photos of this episode, as well as links and information for Allison, WLWT, and Left Bank Coffee, all at thedistillerpodcast.com. The Distiller is produced, recorded, and hosted by me, Brandon Dawson. Our show is mixed and edited by Justin Golden. Photos for this episode are by the amazing Angie Lipscomb of Angie Lipscomb Photography. You can find links to her work on our website. Hire her. She's amazing. Our logo was designed by Scott Ryan, and our videos are by Mike Helm of Minute Moments Pictures. You can find The Distiller wherever you listen to podcasts and listen and download every episode of The Distiller at thedistillerpodcast.com, where you can also find links photos of the guests and locations, and a map of all of our show locations. 
If you like what we're doing, please follow, like, and share our posts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you'd like to help support us in creating The Distiller, just go to thedistillerpodcast.com and click on the Become a Patron button for more information. And finally, we would love it if you'd rate and review The Distiller wherever you listen. That helps us get the word out and helps new people find out about the show. You can always email us at mail at thedistillerpodcast.com to tell us who you think should be on the show to talk about their search for meaningful work or where you think we should record the next show. But whether by email, on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, drop us a line. We love to hear from you. Until next time, I'm Brandon Dawson. Thanks for listening to The Distiller. Bye-bye.